Eric's going to talk about the Paleosol record of the Casamovia. So take it away. Great. Uh, yeah, thank you, Spencer. And thank you, Bill. And don't worry, my last name is, is quite long. So um, that's very common. Um, this is a collaborative talk between Neil and I. Um, and we're going to share our biases, essentially, um, uh, with Neil having a bias more towards the paleo equatorial paleosol landscapes. And then myself, like, like John just mentioned, um, focusing on Gondwana. So um, this is a really kind of lovely dovetail between uh, the work that John and his students have done and then uh, some of the work that I, I did back um, in my dissertation. And so um, speaking of that, this is what the Casamovian record looks like um, on Gondwana in Northwestern Argentina in particular. And what you're looking at here is a is a um, anticline, one limb of an anticline near the village of Flaco. And you're looking at the Casamovian strata being these kind of light tan uh, beds on the far kind of right um, next to those red beds, grading, contemporary, uh, grading um, continuously into the acelian um, into the foreground here. And so like John just mentioned, um, this is evidence of uh, a non-glacial um, interval on this sector of Gondwana. Uh, next slide, please. Um, and as we've talked about so, so many times before, one of the preeminent challenges that we all face is, um, is the calibration of Earth time, particularly so when we're dealing with paleosols um, in fully terrestrial strata. Um, often what we're looking at from a taphonomic standpoint are the worst places to go find uh, different biostratigraphically important fossils. Super crappy fossil preservation, but super important preservation of um, aspects of sedimentary systems and of paleoclimate. And so it behooves us then to find new and exciting ways to try to calibrate earth time in these fully terrestrial successions in order to make as secure of a conclusion or a, um, a strong correlation, not only within a basin, um, but beyond different basins um, themselves. Uh, next slide, please. So I wanna mention just uh, firstly, um, a bit of bias. And just so you have an idea why I'm not gonna talk about coal that much in this talk, this talk is gonna be intentionally biased towards non-hydromorphic mineral paleosols. What does that mean? Basically non-wetland, non-aquatic environments. Um, that's gonna be probably talked about at length tomorrow for sure. Um, and it's super important. And I think it's really important to talk about that in a paleobotanical context as well. Um, this little cartoon kind of showcases us what those aquatic environments might look like. Um, but there are these other environments adjacent to them, perhaps on a mosaic of landscapes um, that might be more well-drained, might be upland soil environments. And that'll be the focus of this, of this talk, uh, both in the paleo-equatorial latitudes and the paleo-mid-latitudes of Gondwana. Uh, next slide, please. And the reason why is this, this is a dated paleogeographic map. And obviously, uh, John just showcased for us um, the kind of more current view of Gondwana and glaciation. So the real estate looks a lot different, um, but that's the key point here is that there's a lot of real estate for uh, non-hydromorphic um, upland soil development, both in Pangaea, but also on Gondwana as well. Um, so a lot of work has been done in the paleo-equatorial realm and will continue to be done there um, near paralic successions, um, but there's lots of areas in perhaps other more, um, uh, more emergent intracratonic basins that might preserve uh, Casanova and paleosols. One of the challenges will be um, accurate chronostratigraphy and biostratigraphy to constrain those ages um, to better understand uh, the paleo landscapes in the Casanovian. Uh, next slide, please. All right, so what I wanna do now is just kind of chat a bit about soils in, in particular. So these next few slides, we're kind of we're kind of drill down into the concepts of what is a soil and a paleosol, um, hopefully to, to kind of better utilize uh, these, these fossil records of a landscape environment. And then we'll talk about the specifics of the Casanovian landscapes as we as we know them to be from from these particular study areas in this talk. Um, one of the first things I want to do is talk about the definition of soil. It's super helpful for me in the field to kind of have this definition in the back of my mind. And it's from the USDA uh, soil survey, which is basically that soil is the natural medium by which land plant growth develops 
whether or not a discernible horizon forms. Um, and that last part, whether or not a discernible horizon forms is super important because not all of the soils that we see in the modern north of rock record are these very sexy, you know, two meter tall, very colorful soils with lovely carbonate nodules. Some of them some of them will have relic sedimentary bedding and might look like uh, just a sedimentary deposit, but it might have an in-situ fossil forest rooted into it. And I've encountered that before um, in my work uh, with John in, Ar in, 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 um, in Antarctica, uh, for example, in the Permian. And so that definition of what a soil is, is super helpful in kind of decoding the, the rock record in more detail, um, where you might see just bedded gray shale and kind of carbonaceous shale that looks just like a sedimentary, but there's actually a fossil forest rooted into it. Um, that should give us some pause to interrogate the stratigraphic record in more detail to, cover, to uncover these, these soils where they exist, where we might kind of pass through them. Once you're confident that you're looking at a paleocell, um, we then turn to process. That's one of our main uh, areas of research in the field and then in, in the lab um, to use these, these uh, archives for paleoclimate. And the soil processes relate to five state factors. I've listed just two here on the upper part of the slide, climate and organisms. Climate is viewed as the, probably the most important aspect that controls soil development, but that should be a word of caution. Um, soil macromorphology, as we'll learn in a few slides, is really loosely correlated to, to specific climate regimes. It's tempting to want to interpret a succession of vertisols and argillosols and calcisols as a, as a sequence of, of climate variation through time. But those three different soil types can equally form under the same exact climate. Um, so we need to do a bit more work uh, uh, to really understand the climate variation in deep time. Uh, next, next slide, please. All right, um, so this is just a view of what modern taxonomy of soils look like to give a sense for the diversity of soils on modern day landscapes. We don't tend to use modern taxonomy to describe uh, the fossil record of soils because we lack many of the observable qualities that define this taxonomic system. Um, but just simply put, there are 12 soil orders um, listed across the globe. This is the USDA system. There's 72 variants of those 12 soil orders. That's a measure of diversity of different soils on the, on the global landscape. Uh, next slide, please. If we take that same modern soil analog perspective and look at what might have existed during the Casamobian, we basically have nine soil orders. Uh, if we just remove those soil orders for which um, angiosperm vegetation has a dominant control on soil forming processes since angiosperms did not exist in the Casanovian. Um, these are what we're left with as possible soils on Casanovian landscapes across the globe. Um, and for reference to us, uh, histosols are our, 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 our organic soils, and so those are our coals. Um, and we'll look at um, many soils that might be aridosols, uh, even though we don't call them aridosols because that's, that's an interpretation of climate. Uh, we don't know climate a priori, so um, there's many kind of soil types that fit into that aridosol um, camp. Next slide, please. All right, so just really briefly, this is a cartoon that uh, Neil put together on just how do you make a paleocell? How do, you, how do these things uh, form and get preserved in the rock record? Um, and there's a few ways to look at this. Um, soils uh, are forming either in a continuum, uh, a balancing act, if you will, between the rates of sedimentation and rates of soil forming processes. So the sedimentary system and sedimentary environment is actually super crucial to understand soil genesis and paleosol genesis. And this kind of speaks really directly to Lynn's talk, which I am super excited about because one of the main contributors to the sediment influx to soils is from alien dust deposition. And so having our mind turned to the sky and thinking about um, alien sediment supply volumes and alien sediment transport volumes and zonal wind directions, um, I think should be a crucial aspect for how we evaluate the paleo soil, paleo soil forming systems um, in the rock record. Um, but with that balancing act, um, you can have two different kinds of soil formation um, in general, this per descensum, so from the top down, so you're kind of gradually accumulating material, 
the soil is transforming and altering that material and it's kind of leaching downwards like a chromatographic strip. Or you might have a abandonment or some kind of uh, um, sediment bypass where there's non-deposition occurring and soil essentially is developing in the situ um, in a purisensum from bottom up or kind of from inside out um, kind of approach. And then like many other fossils, soils are subject to taphonomic processes, so erosion being the key process there. We often lack the soil surface horizons, that particular part of the soil that was in contact with vegetation and with the atmosphere. And we're often left with the more easily preserved subsoil and then parent material below it. Um, next slide, please. Um, this, is a, uh, this is how we actually classify soils in the rock record as paleosols. Um, there's actually uh, nine paleosol orders here instead of the 12 modern systems. I'm not gonna go into this in any great detail, but just to pinpoint um, each of these categories, you can, you can enter this flow chart at any point um, to classify a soil. And how this is working is you're, you're focusing on specific observations you can make that speak to a specific kind of process. So for example, in the upper left, there's organic matter content, which is referring us to a histosol paleosol order and that's telling us about the process of organic matter subsidy to the land surface, the rate of it, relative to the rate of organic matter decomposition. Um, and then we just move, if, you know, it's a, and it's, a, it's a dichotomous key, so it's a yes or no um, question. And you kind of move through this scheme um, in this way. Like I mentioned earlier with paleoclimate interpretations, um, we often want to take our macromorphology of, of, of soils and and begin interpreting them in a paleoclimate context. And we can do that confidently with about two soil orders out of these nine. Uh, gypsosol, so when you have some kind of pseudomorph after gypsum um, that you can confidently say is, was forming in the soil forming environment at that time, or oxisols um, in younger time intervals that are highly weathered, highly aluminous um, soils that lack uh, clay alluviation. Um, you can be confident you're looking at arid or ever wet climates. But all the other soil orders listed here, they can form under a wider range of climate regimes. And so using this raw macromorphology that we see in the field to interpret paleoclimate should be viewed as suspect. Uh, next slide, please. So how do we get to paleoclimate? We need to do a little bit more work and geochemistry is one of our best um, angles to, to leverage the soil forming processes towards that aim. And one of the key things we can do, um, it's relatively inexpensive, it's easy to accomplish in many laboratories across the globe, is the analysis of major element chemistry of soils. So I'll use this uh, Triassic soil here from Antarctica that you see as a case study. This is a soil that uh, we described um, about six years ago um, uh, from the early Triassic and an undergrad student has been working on the soil uh, with me to develop the geochemistry of it. Um, so you can see there's five different horizons here. The parent material are the sea horizons, these lower two green colored horizons. There's actually a manganese nodule in the CG2 horizon where, near where that hand lens is. And you can actually detect manganese in the field using hydrogen peroxide. Um, it's another little tip that we, we, we use. Uh, to detect manganese nodules. Then there's the subsoil, the B horizons. And there, you see this lowercase t next to the B horizons. And that's, an, that's the most important um, letter that we use in soil science that indicates um, subsoil development of clay and clay alluviation in the subsurface. So this is a clay bearing soil developed on a sandstone parent material. Um, the major element chemistry that we can resolve from any paleosol gives us immediate access to some really um, really great paleoclimate proxies. Rainfall in, in the form of mean annual precipitation. We can resolve that from many different proxies. I listed two here, CIA minus K uh, from Nathan Sheldon or CalMag for vertisols um, as two of the more widely applied proxies. We can also look at the balancing act of incoming rainfall versus outgoing evapotranspiration. And that's a proxy I developed uh, during my dissertation. We'll talk about that possibly soil temperature. There's other better ways we can get at temperature though, so I won't go into detail on that. We can get at paleo environment as well. We can kind of look at the major element chemistry and relay it to what we see 
in the macromorphology of these paleosols. So look at processes like clay translocation, like I mentioned, that forms these BT horizons, or the neosynthesis of clay. So clay that's actually forming in the soil environment from the weathering of primary minerals, redox processes, or the differential elution of different um, metal cations um, in the soil environment. All right, next slide, please. All right, so um, let's say you take this particular soil and we sample it. Um, our sampling prot protocol is to try to isolate soils based on their horizons. Um, horizonation is one of the key processes that generates soils. Um, and so a good sampling strategy is just to sample soils by their identified soil horizons and or any other uh, notable property in that particular paleocell profile. And when you do that, you get this kind of diagram on the upper right, which is a graph of different elements um, by their color, uh, their molar properties on the x-axis, which you see on the above the upper part of the diagram. And the y-axis is just the depth in the soil profile. And I've labeled the horizon uh, names there for you. And so it looks like a bunch of spaghetti. It's kind of a hard to interpret diagram at this juncture. It's hard to know what to do with that, but we want to get paleoclimate from this. We want to get paleo temperature, paleo rainfall. We want to get some kind of climate parameter out of this data. Um, and it's important to stop here and revert our attention back to some key processes and, um, and properties of these soils to make the most co secure conclusions that we can about paleoclimate. So what we want to do is first recognize that soil processes are all relative. So I can't tell you a specific concentration of aluminum or a percent difference change in aluminum or silicon that relates to a certain climate state. Um, you just can't say that. It's all relative to what material is being input into the soil system, uh, what the rates of processes are, where are the dominant processes acting on a soil environment. And they're all relevant over one cubic meter of volume. That's kind of the minimum spatial scale that we consider soil systems at. Um, so we need to view our profiles in that relative framework and focus on soil processes. And then we need to consider what is the diagenetic system like uh, that affected the soil after it had been buried um, in the subsurface for some time. Uh, next slide, please. Okay, so I've taken that uh, um, plot of all of those elements in that little spaghetti noodle diagram and I've organized them based upon their kind of key, how they relate to key processes in the soil. So these are all the same data, just kind of stretched out and put in different diagrams for us. Uh, this first diagram on the upper left is looking at sodium concentrations in dark blue and calcium concentrations in the lighter blue color. We, we look at these concentrations um, as an important process that dictates the movement of clay-sized particles in the soil environment. Divalent cations like calcium tend to create flocks or flocculate particles, and that inhibits the lateral or vertical migration of material in a soil profile. So it's known to be a prerequisite to form a clay horizon that you must first alluviate or leach out calcium, and that would include calcium carbonate minerals uh, from the upper part of the soil horizon to some depth, perhaps even out of the soil system entirely. Sodium, monovalent cations like sodium, they tend to act to disperse uh, fine grain particles. And so the combination of low calcium and kind of moderate or high sodium is a great um, line of evidence to say that less lavage, the process of translocation of these particles in the soil profile, occurred in this paleosol. And we see that evidence by the aluminum, magnesium, and potassium concentrations in the upper right diagram there where that blue arrow is pointing. And so we see that, that, that same process occurring in these major elements as we saw them in the macromorphology of this paleosol profile in the field. We can also look at redox processes. We can do that with rare earth elements. It's a very common approach. Here we're looking at manganese um, because we did observe that a manganese nodule um, exists in the parent material of this particular soil profile. And we see manganese concentrations um, being true to those observations that we made in the field, um, where we have invariant and low manganese concentrations in the upper subsoil increasing into the parent material. And that gives us a kind of interpretation of 
where a low oxygen content static water table may have been, a capillary fringe evidenced by this redox amorphic color change, and then the more well-drained Vado zone, fully red, uh, full of alluvial clay and iron nodules in this case. So the big picture with how we're looking at the chemistry here is that we're seeing soil processes preserved in this particular paleosol. And that gives us confidence then that we might actually have some record of climate encoded in this geochemistry. So this lower right diagram, CIA minus K, is just a calculation of that parameter from the major element chemistry in the soil. And we see a classic kind of soil profile, um, step function-like change. Um, that's ideally, what you want to see is some big shift in chemistry from the parent material to the subsoil or from the surface soil to the subsoil. And we see that kind of big shift in this particular profile here. Um, of note is that we want to have some major difference in that value of at least 5% difference. Um, the reason being is that we want to be in, to ensure that this soil environment formed in equilibrium with its climate, with its biosphere, uh, with its sedimentary system, because soils can form in, in disequilibrium with their environment. And when they do that, they're most likely not going to record a chemical signature um, of climate. It might be a chemical signature of something else. Uh, and it's important to kind of distinguish soils that were in equilibrium with their environment versus soils that might be polygenetic or out of phase um, with their paleoclimate situation. Um, next slide, please. And lastly, diagenesis. We are very concerned about diagenesis, um, not because we're trying to avoid it. It happened. It happened to um, all of your paleosols um, to some extent. And so we want to know by how much and what did it affect um, in your soil environments. And for clay-rich soils like this, we're concerned with clay mineral diagenesis. Um, and the, and the pre, uh, prevalent process there that we're concerned with is the process of smectite illitization. Um, this is a process that can occur in soil environments, but is really predominant in the burial environment um, through enhanced uh, orthoclase dissolution, liberating potassium that can cause the growth of these illite interlayers. So illite is a mineral, a clay mineral from the mica group. It's a two to one mineral, meaning it has um, two octahedral layers sandwiching a tetrahedral silicate layer, but it's non-expansible, whereas smectite is an expansible two to one phyllosilicate. Um, illite is a problematic mineral. It can be detrital, so washed in as part of the sediment supply to the soil system or rained down uh, from the alien deposition. It can form in the soil and it can form in the burial diagenetic environment. And so we wanna assess what the clay mineralogy is of this particular soil. And this in the soil um, has smectite illite inner layers, and it also has kaolinite in it as well. Um, and so we can quantify that and uh, begin assessing the validity of applying these proxies uh, given that diagenetic setting. Uh, next slide, please. Okay, so once we've completed our diagenetic assessments, We've um, studied the processes that may be preserved in this paleosol, and we've kind of relayed them to the physical properties that we can observe in the field. Uh, we might have more confidence now to begin applying some kind of geochemical proxy for climate. So that's all the work that we want to do in order to say how rainy or dry it was. Um, uh, and that's kind of the standard process by which we go through that. Um, this is an example of just two proxies. The, the well-known CIA minus K rainfall proxy by Nathan Sheldon is shown in the upper right diagram. Um, we simply just apply our CIA minus K value to this uh, regressed equation and calculate mean annual precipitation within standard error. Um, or we can also use that same uh, relationship and look at the balancing act of evapotranspiration and mean annual rainfall shown in the lower right diagram, uh, which is a proxy I generated as part of my dissertation. Uh, the particular soil that we've been looking at as a case study is just shown by that little tiny arrow there. Um, in the context of other soils from the literature, um, just to give us a context for changes in seasonality um, and possibly the biome type uh, that may have existed um, in equilibrium with these soil environments. So this becomes kind of a powerful tool to, become, to be investigating geospatial trends in climate 
um, as well as temporal variation in paleoclimate. And we'll look at how that impacts the Casanovian interpretation um, in a moment. Uh, next slide, please. Okay, um, and I have a few minutes here, so we'll kind of move through these. These are our proxies we might use, stable isotopic values of calcite in calcite nodules and soils, as well as occluded organic matter in um, the carbonate nodules themselves. This can give us a measure of mean annual rainfall. This is a proxy from Neil Tabor. Um, next slide, please. Um, this has been applied to the Permian Triassic successions, but not to the Casimovian. And as we'll see in a few slides, um, super uh, readily available to apply this proxy to the Casimovian environments, both in paleoequatorial Pangaea and in Gondwana. All right, next slide, please. We can also use stabilized type geochemistry of phyllosilicates. This is from the Illinois Basin. Um, and I'll move to the next slide here. Next slide, please. Same data, but just calculated as paleo temperatures. Using two different element systems in one mineral, you can calculate a paleo temperature based on stable isotopic values. Um, you need two, either two minerals and one isotope or one mineral and two isotopes. So clay minerals can achieve that, but you can also um, achieve burial temperatures in the same process. What Neil discovered here in looking at paleo temperatures is that the basin margin of the Illinois basin tended to preserve more orthogenic paleo temperatures through time. And you see here a temperature increase across the Des Moines and Missourian boundary. The basin center, these square and kind of diamond symbols, reflect more higher temperature burial alteration and increased development of illite um, in the paleosols in the central part of the Illinois basin. Uh, next slide, please. We might also use iron oxide minerals like gertite. We have three different stabilized type systems to use. We can also radiometrically date gertite using the uranium thorium helium system. It's basically a one-stop shop for paleoclimate. Um, for on, on, the, on the right side diagram here, we're looking at stable hydrogen and oxygen isotopes from the Moscovian of Argentina. And they showcase like what John mentioned, a change in orographic uh, effects on paleo rainfall um, in that part of Gondwana. Uh, next slide, please. Okay, so now the time we have remaining, we'll look at some of the case studies of Casimovian paleosols. Uh, and it's illustrated by these little red stars. As, as you can see, the paleoequatorial realm is well expressed in these records. Um, and we'll look at my little sandbox area in Northwest Argentina. Also studied by uh, John Isbell and his students, uh, Levi Moxness and Catherine Pauls. We'll talk about some of their work as well. All right, next slide, please. All right, so in the paleo, and so this is kind of touching on a lot of what uh, Ron Martino was mentioning earlier, um, looking at paleocell top cyclothems in the Illinois basin um, with this kind of sequence stratigraphic context, perhaps for um, how we develop these polygenetic soils. Uh, what Neil and his students and other colleagues we're finding in the Illinois basin um, is that these paleocell tops record more polygenetic soil histories of well-drained soils, um, leading to more poorly drained soils and histosols or coal formation. And they interpret that uh, against the sequence stratigraphic framework. As you move to the basin margin in the Illinois basin, the paleocell top cyclothems are more predominantly well-drained um, through time. But in both cases, they seem, they seem to show a progressive increase in aridity. Uh, they're interpreted by changes in clay mineral content, as well as the uh, calcite abundance in those soils. Uh, next slide, please. We see similar cyclothem packages in cyclothem-like strata in fully terrestrial successions, like I think Spencer Lucas mentioned at the, I think the early part of today's talk, uh, of today's session. Also in the Moscow basin, uh, a really cool like Renzina that looks picture perfect from a, uh, a Renzina um, profile that James Bishop and I described in the Arrow Canyon from the Serpicovian, uh, but this is in the, the Casimovian. So there seems to be a pronounced change towards more arid type uh, climates reflected in these paleosols in around the paleoequatorial region. Uh, next slide, please. All right, shifting gears now to um, Gondwana. Um, if we look at the Gondwanan record, this is calibrated with uranium lead ages. Uh, the Casimovian soils that we know of are the soils labeled A, um, F, C, and G. So these are calcite-bearing soils, clay-bearing soils, and then these poorly developed soil profiles. What we see going from the Moscovian and into the Casimovian in Argentina um, is a progressive change in aridity. We see a decline in kaolinite content. We see an increased abundance of, of calcite in paleosols, and we see a change in the depositional setting. 
going from more fluvial, low sinuosity fluvial systems um, with overbank systems <laughs> to um, predominantly alien systems. Uh, next slide, please. And this is a summary diagram of just that time sequence. Um, we see if this onset of aridification happening much earlier than previously thought, um, not at the Carboniferous Permian boundary, but er, uh, older in the Casanovian, um, with abundance of calcite development in these soils, as well as clay translocation. And we don't know how continuous it is. Uh, we see records that Catherine Pauls and John Isbell produced in the Eastern Paganzo Basin that suggests also a nuanced climate variation throughout this time. Um, but we don't have a continuous record across latitude to connect to the paleo equatorial regions to really say, is this a global trend or is this more of an edaphic or regional trend from things like orography or tectonic changes um, on Gondwana? Uh, next slide, please. Um, so, speaking of the nuanced climate, we can use that evapotranspiration and rainfall proxy that I mentioned to look at changes um, in seasonality. If we look on the very far right, we see a record of mean annual precipitation and you see kind of a monotonic trend um, through the Moscovian. If we take that same exact time sequence, the same exact soil environments, and instead plot them as a uh, paleo seasonality record, we see oscillatory climate variation. Um, and you can see the time scale there for reference, um, looking like it's more orbital forced oscillatory climate variation but lots of nuanced climate variation that you wouldn't otherwise suspect from mean annual rainfall. And we can also control this kind of nuanced climate interpretation relative to changes in parent material um, in these lower two diagrams here, just plotting major elements against immobile index elements, titanium and aluminum, to see that these are all still forming, these um, diamond symbols, red and green, are all forming from the same kind of parent material. Um, so it's not changes in the, in the sediment source that's kind of dictating these. Um, changes for us here. Um, and next slide, please. So Eric, Eric, I'm sorry to interrupt. Can you finish yeah. in about one minute? Yep, yep, this is the very last slide. Right. Um, so right on, right on time. Um, so just a synthesis of these paleo environments um, from paleoequatorial Pangaea. We're seeing these changes from more humid, ever wet um, paleocell tops to increasingly semi-arid to perhaps arid climates. Um, we see a similar change at the same time, um, calibrated with uranium lead ages in Northwestern Argentina, going from uh, progressively warmer and more humid environments to progressively more arid climates. We don't know what the temperature change is like, um, but from a rainfall standpoint, it looks more arid. Um, from Eastern Paganzo Basin, Catherine Paul's work with John Isbell showcases also these nuanced climate changes with aridity and then brief glimpses of more humid um, climate spikes uh, through time as well. Um, and that is the end of the talk. I'll be happy to take any questions that you guys have. All right, thank you, Eric. Um, are there questions? Okay, I have a question. Um, this map, this last slide you put up, is this Casabovian time? Uh, yes. So, I'm, I'm just wondering, it seems to me there's a ton of studies of paleosols in the early Permian. Yeah. And then there's only a handful of Casimovian studies. Am I right? Uh, yes, that's, yeah. Serving the literature, there's, there's, a, there's not a high abundance of Casimovian paleosol studies. Yes, yeah, so I wonder, because I, I see that, you know, these look very, the, one, the equatorial ones are, are three different types. And I wonder if you, you know, what do you think is going on here? Is this just a, lack of sampling or is there some sort of different climate regime in Western Pangaea, Western equatorial Pangaea than there is across the equatorial zone? Yeah, um, no, that's a great question. I think that's something that we can also be aided by, by climate modelers with um, developing a more refined understanding of as well. Um, I think it's quite possible that what we're seeing here are glimpses of what might be a more um, regionally discrete um, kind of climate pattern across equatorial Pangaea, um, as opposed to kind of an overwhelmingly mega monsoonal condition affecting the entire region. Um, but it's hard to say with confidence of what that looks like if it's because at the moment it is kind of a sampling bias. There's a, a dearth of samples, even in this well-studied area to really confirm if that's the case or not. Um, and in part, we lack the stratigraphy, or the preservation of it um, on the, on the sort of western and eastern shores of, of equatorial Pangaea. 
And um, so paleoclimate modeling might help to fill in some of those gaps as we continue to kind of probe the stratigraphic record um, to understand that region a bit more in detail. Um, and then as we see in the same map as well, we, we lack a huge amount of spatial coverage for the Northern and Southern hemisphere um, as well. And so uh, developing a more um, quantitative paleoclimate reconstruction from either paleosols or the sedimentary record in these areas is also should be a, a priority uh, going forward as well. Okay, good. So I see Olivia King has a question. Uh, can you turn on your uh, mic and video, Olivia, please? Hello, can you see me? Yeah. Excellent. Uh, I just had a quick question about um, the soil development. You're saying that soils have to be in equilibrium. Um, if they're kind of out of phase, you can't really use them. But is why is that? And uh, can that tell you something about what's going on in the environment, even if it's not in phase? Absolutely, yeah. So, um, so the equilibrium aspect of soils, uh, it really kind of confers to like the chemical development uh, for application for these paleoclimate proxies, be they stabilized topic proxies or major element proxies. Um, soil development takes place over a wide range of time scales, from centennial scales to millennial, multi-millennial scales. Um, and then climate changes can happen on its own um, time sequence. So if a soil environment is not in equilibrium with its climate, um, the major element distribution, the mineralogic change in that soil might not be reflective of that particular balance of rainfall and evapotranspiration. And so the major element chemistry that you might record in that soil or even the stabilized topic values might record something else, maybe a relic property of the sediments supplied to the soil system. Um, and not necessarily the specific climate that the soil is forming under. Um, so that's one of the, the, the challenges with dealing with interpreting paleosol records of climate, is we wanted to kind of establish that there's some kind of equilibrium change in that soil environment to the climate it's forming under. Um, there are morphologic lines of evidence that can tell us that. Um, if a soil is in disequilibrium and it's a clay-bearing soil, uh, there's a horizon called a glossic horizon that can begin, begin developing we have these tongues of low chroma, high value alluvial material um, that are kind of leaching into the subsurface clay horizon. And that's a symptom of a soil that's currently um, adapting to some kind of shift in its environmental conditions. But like you said, um, even if the soil is out of phase with climate and it may not be applicable to use a, uh, um, a quantifiable paleoclimate proxy, like you said, you can still glean information about the sedimentary system that might be really valuable to reconstructing the paleo environment or the paleo ecology um, from those out of phase paleosols. Um, so that there's still a lot of really useful information that you can glean, even if there's less of a confidence that you might have in reconstructing paleo rainfall or paleo temperatures. Perfect, thanks Eric. Okay, we have, we have two minutes here. Um, Bill DeMichael has a question. Uh, maybe a quick question, quick answer. Actually, I think Ron Martino had a question and he sent the question to me. So you might, okay. uh, you might have him come on. Ron, can you uh, turn on your uh, video yeah. audio? Get please? this in quickly. Uh, looking at your diagram here, you show seasonally wet conditions in what I'm guessing is the Appalachian Basin and is seasonally wet and, and ever wet in what might be the Illinois Basin for, the, and I'm, you said this was Chasmobian, is that correct? Yes, yeah, so these are- What kind of paleosols in the Appalachian Basin would reflect seasonally wet conditions? Yeah, so I believe, so I think what Neil's showing here, I think are the histosols that are capping the um, more well-drained uh, underclay paleosols I don't know if they're in the Appalachian Basin, so I can't speak for certainty about if he's putting the ever wet soils um, in a particular type of pedotype in the Appalachian Basin. But I think his idea here with ever wet soils in the, in the Illinois Basin are from the center part of the basin, those polygenetic profiles. Um, I think that's what he's referring to here. Okay, it's because again, the ones in the Appalachian Basin seem to be calcic vertisols. Uh, pretty widespread and I don't see how that would be seasonally wet. I agreed, yeah, agreed. Um, so that's 
yeah, I'm not exactly sure if there's a specific kind of pedotype or if that's just the, you know, if it's not strictly meant to be over the Appalachian Basin um, or not. So this is, this is not a super quantitative diagram as of yet, I would say. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay, well, hey, thank you, Eric. Great talk, a good discussion. Let's move on to the next speaker then to stay on time.